This film is about a scandal, an unseen scandal where the blame is upon all of us. It concerns thousands of our children who are forced to live deeper in the shadows of our society than even those in the prisons. They are the 6,000 mentally handicapped children who live out their lives as long-stay inmates in grim Victorian institutions where they are fed and clothed and left, often just to sit in a corner watching a flickering, meaningless television day after day, year after year. Most of these children get no education at all and are trained for nothing, and many of those who might otherwise walk or even talk never really get the chance because there are not enough physiotherapists or speech therapists, just as there are not enough nurses to play with them or enough specialists to help restore them, as indeed so many of them can be restored. Instead, they are cut off, confined, dumped in places like this. A senior member of the staff at Darren Park Mental Hospital in Kent described the hospital buildings as Dracula's castle. I asked him if he was joking. He said he was not. Darren Park and Leavesden Hospital near London are two of the institutions we filmed, and both are typical of the majority which were built as custodial barracks, isolated from the community. Their wards contain many children whose parents have been reluctantly forced to send them here because there is so little help for them in the community. Mentally handicapped children are discriminated against at almost every level, by public ignorance and prejudice, by the medical profession, and by the authorities whose attitude is best summed up in a white paper which says, these children are the concern of everyone and the responsibility of no one. I believe the way we deal with all the retarded of all ages is bordering on the scandalous in terms of institutions. But when I come to children, I believe they never ought to be in hospital at all. I think this is scandalous beyond anyone's conception. And if any member of the public, be he careful about the amount of tax he's prepared to pay, but to go into a hospital and see some of the situation in there, notwithstanding the loving devotion of the staff, he himself would be scandalized as he should be, as I am too. The effect of any institution, of course, on anyone of whatever age is bad. And in the case of children, it is particularly bad because children are meant to have a loving, almost one-to-one -one relationship with a mother figure, ideally the mother herself and, of course, the father. Given that these children, for re various reasons, are denied this basic right of you and, you and me and the rest of us, uh, then the smaller the unit, uh, the happier that child's not going to be. Unfortunately, most of the institutionalized children at the present time are in large units. A uh, large hospital, as you will know, can go up to about a thousand patients. What is happening in so many of these hospitals, especially with the children, is that they haven't enough uh, stimulation given them uh, to bring about the expected jump forward in their development. And therefore you get a further step to, in the wrong direction toward institutionalization and a further step toward fuller dependency. We want to see less dependent people uh, who can stand on their own feet. This calls for a different look in the way we nurse them uh, and a different look at the way we care for them. The last government census found that a third of all mentally handicapped children in institutions had been given no intelligence testing for more than 10 years. According to the National Society, Many of these children should not be in these places. This is one of the many cold and damp corridors in Leavesden Mental Hospital near London. The other day when I was here, this corridor was partially flooded. And as patients and staff stepped through it, they said it wasn't at all unusual. Of course, Leavesden has been tarted up here and there with formica and coats of paint in order to comply with the latest institutional standards. But its main purpose remains as insidiously, if not exactly, the same as when it was built last century. And that is as a place not so much to treat or to salvage the mentally handicapped, and children especially, as indeed many of them can be salvaged, but as a place to confine them, to dump them, to isolate them from our so-called sane society. Perhaps you think these children should never have been allowed to live. I believe you are wrong. The question surely is how sane is a society that shuts away children who can be part of the life of the community? The 
whole Victorian philosophy of an institution, that of a place in which to put people rather than to treat them, doesn't that with all your problems still apply, that you still have a, a custodial institution rather than a place in which people are treated? It may apply in fact, but not in attitude. I don't use the word institution in that sense. I mean, to me, an institution is an organization. It is a, an establishment with a, an objective and a way of working to achieve that objective as best it can, as economically as it can, as efficiently as it can. If, by the word institution, you imply some Victorian lockup where as many people are cared for by as few as cheaply as possible, that doesn't apply now. But surely, as you just described it, that does apply. As many are being cared for by as few for as cheap as possible. That's not... Uh, you, 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 surely, you, at your end of the National Health Service, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the most uh, starved end of the uh, National Health Service, yes. along with geriatrics. And you yes. have very few staff. I would have thought that applies yes. perfectly. But that, that is not uh, of our making. This is not what we are suggesting or have planned. This, is may, this may be how it turns out in practice, because other people won't join us. A Department of Health white paper found that in many institutions there was only one nurse to care for up to 16 children. At Darren's Park Hospital, I found one nurse attempting to care for 25 children. The white paper says that the children's so-called treatment is restricted to getting them up in the morning, dressing, washing and feeding them, and putting them to bed at night. The direct result of this staff shortage is boredom, tension and occasional violence. The children become apathetic and sink into a state of complete physical and social dependence. And nurses become deeply frustrated by having no time to use the psychiatric skills in which they have been trained. The white paper was presented to Parliament in 1971 and was largely ignored. Since then, staff shortage has become worse and is now critical. Nursing assistants, who are meant to be parents to these children, are among the lowest paid workers in the country. This is Harperbury Hospital near London. In some ways it fits the traditional pattern, but there is a real difference here. The difference is Dr. Derek Ricks, who is not a captive of the institution. Dr. Ricks knows these children can be salvaged because he and his staff are doing it. This is Paggy, who was a little boy, very handicapped indeed when I first met him. He was uh, sitting in a chair, really stretched back with extensor spasm. Uh, very di difficult indeed to feed with uh, clenched teeth and thrusting of his tongue and difficult head control. And because we've uh, had uh, the help of an orthopedic surgeon to uh, relax the spasm in his legs, he's now sitting much more stably. And after a matter of about a year, he's beginning to feed himself. And uh, not only is he doing that, as you see, but he's sitting much more effectively. He's looking around and he's beginning to do things with his hands, other than feeding as well. He's really um, starting to function as yes, a human being. Yes, he is indeed. But isn't, isn't, this, isn't Peggy, then, a very good example of what can be done with a seemingly hopeless child? Yes, I think he, he is a very good example. He's a very rewarding example uh, of a child that really, if we hadn't put this effort in, I think would have been bedridden, would have been totally helpless. I think you've described him as a piece of wreckage. Yes, he, he was a piece of wreckage, and he would still have been a piece of wreckage without the effort of everybody that's helped in this project, really, with him. Has this has simply been intensified care, intensified intention? Yes, and, and, and also, uh, I think, skilled and uh, what would like to feel expert assessment of the situation and the help of um, but in a large institution, if Haggy was in a ward of, say, 20 children with one or two nurses treating them, he would, would simply... Do, yes. Oh, yes, it would be very difficult indeed to, to do this sort of thing because to uh, nurse him and help him to recover from the operation and to get him moving in the way that we have done has been a full-scale exercise involving a lot of people most of the time, yes. If you could apply the same skilled attention to all the children, to all mentally handicapped children. How much do you think you could, you could uh, release children into the community? How much would you cut down, in fact, the population of our institution? Well, I think we could convert most children into uh, children with a level of self-help which would make them manageable in community placements. Um, 
So what you're doing really is Which is, is converting them from vegetables into yes. human beings. Well, yes, we'd like to think so. Yes, yes, we'd like to think that. Mark is a little twelve-year-old boy who's been with us quite a long time. And, as you see, he's now sitting really quite uh, stably in, in his chair. This is a wheelchair, and we're working on getting him able to, to use it and push it around. Um, he's a little boy who was uh, premature and had a lot of uh, damage to his brain as a, as a baby and is a, a child with spastic quadriplegia. What, what, uh, what is his maximum? What can you hope to achieve? We've had, for instance, we've had his hips uh, examined and he's had an operation on his hips which have assisted his sitting. Um, and he now has uh, a better sitting position and is able, as a result, to balance, yes. to yes. use his hands. Yes. And uh, he will play quite simply. His, his teachers are pleased with his progress, which is very limited, of course, but in, nonetheless it enables him to handle simple toys. It would be ambitious to expect him to dress himself, but he could help dress himself. Well, I mean, well, he wouldn't be yes. a severe burden on any caring staff. And he's a responsive, likable little boy. What, what would he uh, need? What kind of attention would he need? For... Well, in terms of within the within the, the the home for which we would aim to place him. Yes. Well, he would need um, certainly a one to two ratio within the home, I think. Um, and but mainly people who were prepared to uh, to tackle and help the. Uh, the needs of a child this handicapped. What, what are the prospects of him going into such a home? Negligible. Why? Well, they're not around. The, the, the homes aren't available. So they come at the, to the end of their, the, the, the natural end of their institutional life when they must move on to the press and there's nowhere for them to go. No, so that's, yes, that's, that's yes. a very real problem. Hey, children, me center, me center, me the extension of Dr. Derek Ricks's work is here, in a very different kind of hospital, the Hilda Lewis Centre for Specially Handicapped Children in London. For every child here, there is a nurse or an expert to stimulate him, to play with him, to make him laugh. The Hilda Lewis Centre is an experiment, the only one of its kind in Britain, and has only places for 24 children, but its very being shows what can be done. Everything is informal here. The staff don't wear uniforms and some of the children go home at night. Unlike in the big institutions, the assessment of the children's disability and of how best they can be treated goes on all the time. Gradually, patiently, the children are taught to be functioning human beings. How to go to the toilet, how to wash, how to use a hairbrush, the simple vital things that will bring them back into the community. The children here are never allowed to vegetate. Every day they are given individual and group therapy. Special games such as this are played, so that each child is given a chance to develop his maximum, to improve, and eventually to go home. Ah! Ronnie, sit down. Do this. Do this. Do this. Good girl, Good, Ronnie. Ronnie. Good boy. This is Paddy. Paddy was found in a big institution where he was classified as severely retarded. When he came to the Hilda Lewis Center, it was discovered that he was not severely retarded at all that he simply couldn't make himself understood. He was trapped in his own little prison of silence and should never have been accepted into an institution. Paddy realized his dilemma and this made him very angry. Paddy seldom gets angry now. He has in fact become very different since he's been here and he's much easier to control. He's nothing like so aggressive as he was. In fact, are you saying then that he would have been regarded as and spent perhaps the rest of his life as a subnormal child? if he hadn't have come here. 
Well, I think that's possible. In fact, the teacher at the school where he was had already realized that he was much brighter than she had been told he was. But it wasn't until he was uh, um, assessed using methods suitable to him that he realized that um, he, he wasn't subnormal. He might well, because of his difficulties, have remained in uh, some sort of institutional care indefinitely, I think. The great majority of kids in institutions never get out. For them, the years simply pass, and they become adults without education or skills. In 1970, an act of parliament gave all children the right to education, regardless of handicap. By May 1974, only two projects approved by the Department of Education provided classes for mentally handicapped children in ordinary schools. Times may have changed since these men were children, but 17 mental hospitals in Britain still have no speech therapist, and 12 hospitals still have no physiotherapist, and 19 still have no social worker. One child destined for life in big institutions is Stephen Kingham, unless the system changes and there is some other way out. How old is he, Mrs. King? Seven last July. Did you have him at home after his born? No. no, I didn't want him. Didn't want to know him. She did. She wanted him. Did you know before he was born that he was going to be I deformed? Did. Nobody would believe me. But I was so ill, I was convinced that he was wrong. But when it actually happened, I couldn't accept it. I didn't want him. I wouldn't look at him, I wouldn't touch him. What did you do then? I begged them to put him away, I begged them to kill him. That's all I could think. You must kill him, you must make him live. But now, of course, we wouldn't part with him for the world. Quite often the children are handicapped children from a strained, stressed family situation. Uh, the, the family can't cope with the child. Um, the child gets into considerable difficulty. They become very disturbed and erratic in their behavior and are not acceptable within the local provisions, local schools. And uh, residential places have to be found and out they come to us. With this background, you see, parents quite often have a long history of, in retrospect, of misery, of um, irritation, of sheer inconvenience with the children. Um, and, what, what and, and in fact, they, 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 won't, um, they won't take kindly to uh, trying to come back with the, no. trying to come back to the hospital to get the child. Uh, to get, they're afraid often that the child will, they will, if the child improves, that they will be expected to take yes. them home again, because they have this recollection yes. of so much difficulty. <laughs> you why is the number of the children rocked. Black is important. You said they were bored. Now, if you had an adequate number of staff, if you had one-to-one, -one, as yeah. I think you said you, you should have, well, then the children wouldn't be bored. They, they would then be progressing. They, you would then be stimulating them, would you not? Yes, yes, indeed, you would. Um, yes, I, I, there may well be limits to how much you can, um, or for how long yeah. you can stimulate these children, but certainly, um, we are by no means adequately provided to, to keep these children occupied and content. Um, uh, so that the pressure on us is simply to be custodial. Mm. 
and to keep the children quiet, to keep them um, appropriately contained, and therefore they're bored and therefore they rot. Only two children in a ward of 19 were visited on the Sunday I was at Leavesden Hospital. In fact, many parents are anxious to visit their children and sometimes feel a terrible guilt for not doing so. But the expense of getting to an isolated institution is often too great for working families. The Department of Health is responsible for ensuring that these families are helped. The reality is that help is seldom given. The large institutions, the majority of institutions for mentally handicapped children, are simply places where we put people. In other words, they're dumping grounds. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, yes it is, and it's one which I think is, uh, is needed both by the people that use the institution and the people within the institution, quite often. What do you mean exactly? Well, it's, uh, it gives the people within the institution a role which they can accept. Um, it's uh, less disruptive than having uh, uh, really very difficult Shake his hands. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Both hands. Come on. That's it. Shake his hands. Say hello. Make him walk. Make him walk. Walk to you. Walk to you now. Coming to you. Coming to you. Hold him. Coming to you. Hold him. That's it. Hold him. Hearing your excitement and seeing the results of it and some of the children you and your colleagues treat here is unusual for us. We don't seem to get that kind of excitement in other places throughout the profession. Could you perhaps help to explain this to us? In fact, we get an inertia in large institutions where mentally handicapped children are. There is an inertia amongst members of your profession. Well, it may be that I'm just unrealistic in believing that these children can be helped to the extent that they can, but I'm sure I, I don't think that. And certainly the evidence that we have here doesn't, uh, doesn't bear that out. Um, I think you have to believe this, um, and you have to believe it very strongly. Um, and the temptations of, I think many people within the field are dealing with such numbers and with adults and with children and with all the social problems associated with, with the handicapped, that it's very difficult to perhaps to focus your attention on this really quite exciting area. Helping to restore these children may be exciting to Dr. Ricks, but to most of the community they remain just human wreckages and incredibly even objects of fear. A doctor told me of a meeting with a town councillor about a proposal for a neighbourhood hostel for mentally handicapped children, close to their homes. The councillor said to the doctor, Look, I'm very sorry, but if I supported that, I'd be finished politically. The ratepayers would never stand for it. You've got to understand their feelings. If you believe these children are hopeless, unsalvageable, without thoughts, without feelings, unworthy of a place in the community, then go to one of these places and give just one child a few minutes of your time. Adrian. 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 Huh? Adrian. Adrian. Hey, Adrian. Adrian. Say something strange right now. Give us a smile. Come on. Adrian. Come on. Let's hold this. Come on. What's all this? Come on. Right? There it is. There it is. What's now, is? surely, isn't this an example of attention given to a child? Yes. That he responds? Yes. So, otherwise, the child could just sit there without that. Now, he's responded to me because uh, I've given him my complete attention. That's right. That's right. So, if, if uh, you had the ideal situation, you would have one person to all of these children. You could stimulate them yes. to a point of communicating through at least smiling. On a wall at the National Society for Mentally Handicapped Children is a copy of the Declaration of Human Rights signed six years ago. Article 2 says that every mentally handicapped child has the right to such education, training, rehabilitation and guidance that will enable him to realize his potential to the fullest possible extent. 
Article 4 says that every mentally handicapped child has the right to live in surroundings as close to a normal life as possible. Such fine, correct, noble words. But they're only words. Just as this film is only words and images that will dissolve and go away in a minute or two. But the children you will have seen in this film won't go away. They exist. They feel. They are aware. They laugh. They need. They're everybody's children.